when there is the fear of the Lord and the love of the Lord and others, we find that courage often results. We look at all the martyrs who astonished the people that were putting them to death with the peace that they had in their hearts as they faced uh, imminent death. Welcome to the Basic Training Podcast. This is a weekly live recording of a course led by Dr. Robert Forney to several men at Trinity Presbyterian Church in Spartanburg, South Carolina. The main topic of this course is how to be a man of God in today's society. Welcome to Basic Training Podcast. I have one more podcast that I'd like to do on fatherhood. This came up uh, recently in the last couple of weeks. It became uh, clear to me that there are many young people who have grown up in Christian homes who attend church. They think they're Christians. Their parents think they're Christians. But they don't know how to talk about it. They don't know actually the scriptures. They don't know what it means to be a Christian in an accurate way. So I did some research, and I found out that this is actually a very widespread and common problem. In this podcast, uh, I've titled it, Fathers Teaching the Love of God in Jesus Christ and Confidence of Eternal Life. And there are problems with this. The big problem is that youth are losing their hearts, that is, leaving the Lord in their hearts in elementary, middle, and high school. Uh, According to George Barna, in a survey of 22,000 adults and over 2,000 teenagers in 25 separate surveys, six out of 10 20-somethings who were involved in church during their teen years are already gone. And only 20% who were churched as teens are still spiritually active by age 29. There's two causes for young people uh, leaving the faith or not growing in faith. The first is an overexposure to worldly philosophy. If teenagers' perceptions are primarily influenced by the media, peers, and mad-centered education, such as public schools or private schools that are not Christian, they will naturally have a distorted view of Christianity. When we don't aggressively counter the lies of the world with biblical truth, youths are easily taken captive by deceptive philosophies. Uh, In Colossians, Paul wrote, See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. When teens are not equipped to combat false ideas with sound answers, they are dazzled and consumed by the godless culture. Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 wrote, For we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And so the first common causes of youth leaving the faith or not growing the faith, the first is overexposure to worldly philosophy that's not being opposed. And the second is an overdependence on church programs. Even in the 21st century, parents are the single most important influence on the spiritual lives of adolescents, not church leaders or programs. A survey that was done found that many teenagers you use the youth group more as a source of social gatherings rather than for spiritual growth. When asked, the ones, these 60% that left, when they were surveyed and asked why they had left, the the top five reasons were that church was boring, second, legalism, third, the hypocrisy of leaders, fourth, that the church was too political, and a fifth, that the people in church are self-righteous. Ken Ham, who 
is a creationist near Cincinnati, uh, the Ark Encounter, something that he did, and he's written many books and, and uh, done many things about uh, Genesis and creation. He wrote a book called Already Gone, Why Your Kids Will Quit Church and What You Can Do to Stop It. I recommend this book to you. It was written in 2009, New Leaf Publishing. I think if you look for it online, Already Gone, Ken Ham, I think you can find it. So young people are leaving the faith. 85% of youth from Christian homes attending public schools do not hold a biblical worldview. Many teens leave church during or after their freshman year in college. From the Southern Baptist Convention made a survey, and they are currently losing between 70 and 88 percent of their youth after their freshman year in college. Seventy percent of teenagers involved in church youth groups stop attending church within two years of their high school graduation. Most 20-somethings, that is those who are in their 20s today, leave the faith. Uh, a majority, that is 66 percent in a Barna survey, uh, have been churched at one point during their teen years, but now are disengaged. Uh, most teenagers do not believe that Jesus is the Son of God. 63% of teenage Christians don't believe that Jesus is the Son of the one true God. 51% don't believe that Jesus rose from the dead. 68% don't believe that the Holy Spirit is a real entity. And only 33% of church youth have said that the church will play a part in their lives when they leave home. This is a survey uh, that was done by Josh McDowell, the famous uh, Campus Crusade apologist, and he published this in a book called The Last Christian Generation. Well, he believes that the current generation of Christians is the last one because the faith is not being passed on to, to uh, the next generation. Here's some more reasons why Christian kids leave the faith. They leave because they have troubling, unanswered questions about the faith. They leave because their faith was not, quote, working for them. Third, they, le they leave because they allowed other things to take priority. And lastly, they leave because they never personally owned their faith. There's uh, another study of this tried to categorize different kinds of leaders, that there are different categories of those that leave and they are, they are categorized by postmodern leavers, recoilers, modern leavers, neo-pagans, rebels, and drifters. <laughs> you know, when you have that many different categories, you know that you've got a big problem with people leaving the faith. Of course, probably not surprising, uh, college is a big part of the problem. About 25% of college professors, according to a survey, are atheists, professing atheists. About 5 to 7 percent of the general population is atheist or agnostic, but 25 percent of college professors. Only 6 percent of college professors said the Bible is actually the Word of God. 51 percent described it as an ancient book of fables, legends, history, and moral precepts. 75% believe religion does not believe, belong in, uh, in school. What we found is that, and this was what brought me to this, is that young people are inarticulate about their faith, that the majority of teenagers don't know how to speak uh, accurately and completely about their faith, about their beliefs, their practices, and the place that the Lord has in their lives. So, What's a solution? Well, that's what I want to talk about now in this uh, podcast. We parents, and especially fathers, and churches need to educate, discipline, explain, and equip. First of all, we need to educate in sound doctrine. Now, it's beyond the scope of this podcast for me to go through sound doctrine, but we've already been discussing that uh, in earlier podcasts and will continue in the future as we move to talk about the biblical role of a husband in loving his wife. Paul wrote in 2 Timothy, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth, but avoid worldly and empty chatter 
for it will lead to further ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. So we need to educate in sound doctrine, and we need to instill in our young people their need to present themselves approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed because they're able to accurately handle the word of truth. They need to be articulate about their faith. Second, fathers, mothers, churches, youth leaders need to equip young people in apologetics. This means to help them understand how we answer the common questions that are raised about the faith. Now, I want to go through a few of these. This podcast, I don't have uh, the time to go into in depth in this. There are many books that can be very helpful on this subject. Peter, Peter wrote in 1 Peter, he said, Do not fear their intimidation and do not be troubled, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. And so as our young people are encountering questions from their friends, teachers, maybe they're being mocked or uh, joked about, what Peter is saying is don't fear this intimidation and don't be troubled. But the solution is to sanctify, that means to set apart Christ in, as Lord in your hearts and be ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account. So actually, there are only a few questions that come up if we categorize and group them. And I want to go through just a few of these. There are, there are a few others that I won't uh, discuss, but the first one is uh, from an atheist, how do you know God exists? Does God exist? How can we know that? Well, the first thing I would say to this is that faith in God actually comes from God, but it comes from God as a reward for certain activity. Hebrews 11, without faith it is impossible to please him, that is the Lord, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who who seek him. So seeking diligently the Lord is the first criteria. And those who are not seeking the Lord are more apt to be those who are struggling with their faith. The second thing that I would say is uh, under the category of what's called natural revelation. This has also been called the ontological proof. And in a sense, what it is is that all effects have a cause. So the size, order, and beauty of the universe, the earth, and the human body, etc., are effects that must have a cause. Paul writes in Romans, the first chapter, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. So the idea is that God is revealing from heaven and the truth of him that he has revealed in the things that he has made uh, has to be suppressed because what is known about God is evident within them for God made it evident evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made. So they are without excuse. Romans 1, 18 to 20. I often have said to young people, including my, my own uh, children, that when I was young and I looked at the sky and I saw the sc- stars, I wondered how big the universe was. And I tried to imagine the end of the universe. And I couldn't imagine it. I thought, well, if you go to the end of the universe, what does that mean? What's the end? There's got to, is there a wall? What's on the other side of the wall? And through this analysis, what I I learned was that there is such a thing as infinity. I don't understand it. I can't comprehend how something can be infinite. But I perceive that it is in, in the universe. 
And so there are many things that we don't understand, like infinity, that the fact that we don't understand it <clears throat> or can't even really see it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. In fact, uh, if we consider radio waves and, and other things, there's all sorts of invisible things that are real things. They really do exist. And, and this is an evidence, I believe, to the existence of God. Now, there's more evidence. Jesus is a lot of the evidence, the resurrection, etc. The Bible itself, the miraculous nature of the Bible, uh, predictive prophecy, uh, prophets that write uh, very explicitly about things before they happen, even hundreds, thousands of years before they happen, and we can prove that they were written back then, and then we can prove that they come to pass exactly as the prophet said. All these things are additional uh, evidences that God exists and that what the Bible says about him is true. So there's more that can be said about this. I'm just wanting to give some examples of an approach uh, to this. I think our young people need to be, uh, discussions about the existence of God need to be made. Okay, the second is, is Jesus God? As a matter of fact, a number of born-again Christians, people in good churches who are young people, aren't really sure that Jesus is God. This is very rampant today. And so from, from John chapter 10, there are many places in John, but John chapter 10, starting at verse 30, Jesus said this, I and the Father are one. Now, what did he mean by that? Well, we read on in verse 31, the Jews picked up stones to, again to stone him. Jesus answered them, I showed you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you stoning me? The Jews answered, for a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, because you being a man make yourself out to be God. So the Jews understood that Jesus was claiming to be God. Jesus said to them in John chapter 8, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. Now, of course, I am is the name of God, um, Yahweh in Hebrew. Um, and so Jesus is claiming pre-existence like God. In another place, in John 14, Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it's enough for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you, been so long with you, and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak of my own initiative, but the Father abiding in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Otherwise, believe because of the works themselves. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these will he do because I go to the Father." Whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. And so the miracles that Jesus performed, his claims, and ultimately his resurrection prove that he is who he claimed to be. So there's more, a lot more that can be said about this subject as well. Uh, moving on. A third question, that, and this may be one of the most common among those who are, who are not atheists, and that is uh, the question, only Jesus? Is there only one way? Isn't that bigoted? You know, many people are very troubled by this, that, they're, that uh, we Christians are somehow putting down other religions and that other religions are seem, seem to be as valid and in some cases, some people may think they're more valid than Christianity, especially if they see hypocrisy or evil being committed by Christians. Uh, for example, uh, all the child abuse that's been reported uh, among priests and other clergy, this hasn't been scandal. This scandal hasn't been reported as widely in other religions. And so there's a big question about this only way business. Well, the fact of the matter is, the first thing I'd say is Christianity is unique in its appeal to open recorded secular history for its validation. I've actually studied 
many of the world's religions. And when I say this, not just in libraries, but actually by being there. I hitchhiked from Asia around to Europe uh, after a time I spent in the Peace Corps, and I examined these. I'll just give you one example. In the village where the health center that I was stationed, where the supplies were in Thailand, was a very famous Buddhist temple. Uh, it was one of, it would be like Jerusalem to, uh, to Buddhism. And the reason for that is it's where Buddha allegedly went to heaven. So it would be very similar to the account of Jesus on the Mount of Olives in the Ascension. And so then the question is asked, well, how do we know that, that Buddha went to heaven? And here's the answer. I'm not exaggerating. A farmer was in the jungle, and he shot a deer with a bow and arrow. And the deer went off into the woods. And the farmer saw the deer drinking water out of a dep depression in a rock. And the next day, the farmer saw a deer that he thought was the same deer, and the deer was healed. And he said, oh, that depression in the rock must have been Buddha's footprint when he leaped to heaven. Now, what's wrong with it? They built a temple over it. What's wrong with this? Well, there was, o there was only one witness to this. There was not two witnesses. Uh, was it the same deer? Did the guy make this up? You know, it's not validated. Whereas Christianity and the Judaism before it Everything was done in the open before critics and those who don't accept it, recorded in history books, in secular history books, with many witnesses. This makes Christianity unique among religions. The evidence for the resurrection of Jesus and for his life is recorded in secular history. As a matter of fact, it's the reason why we have A.D. and B.C., it's because the whole world recognizes. Now, the Jewish people don't. They, they call it the common era, before the common era and after the common era. But that's because they're rejecting Jesus as the Messiah. But in fact, the whole world is, is a testament to this. How do you get the whole world you know, to change a behavior based on a deer shot with a bow and arrow in a jungle observed by one man who may or may not have seen the same deer? You're not going to you're not going to have uh, the Buddhist calendar taking over the whole world. Okay, Jesus, Jesus proved his claims to deity by the works he's done and the prophecy he f fulfilled. And he said, John 14, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And of course, theologically, we know that we die because we sin. And the only way the Father, this is not my opinion, this is the Father's opinion, the only way the Father can be reconciled and approached and his wrath assuaged is with death. The penalty of sin is death. And Jesus died. Now this is, again, unique in religions. These claims are not made by... Mohammed didn't die for anyone. Uh, he died for himself. Uh, David didn't die for anyone. He died for himself. And Buddha died for himself. This is the uniqueness of Jesus, and it's because it's only in Jesus that uh, the Father's wrath against sin is uh, taken care of. Okay, a lot more that we can say about that one. I'm just giving you uh, ideas as starting points, and I believe that our young people ought to be taught so they're able to answer these very common questions. <clears throat> the next category is the Bible. Is the Bible really the inspired and inerrant word of God? Many young evangelical Christians think of the Bible as with good moral teaching, but it's not the actual very words of God. Uh, so, what do we say about those who question the inspiration and inerrancy of the Bible? Well, the documentation of the historicity of the Bible is unique. 
it far exceeds any other ancient book written before the printing press was formed. I mean, there are thousands of copies that can be compared one to the other to show that the preservation of the text has been done. Now, this doesn't mean it's the Word of God, but it does mean that it's unique you can't find the writings of Socrates or of Muhammad or of any other uh, character from before the uh, invention of the printing press uh, when making thousands and millions of copies became, became very common. You can't, there's, no other, there's no other book. And so we start by saying, well, the Bible is unique in this way. And secondly, archaeology has time and time again explained seemingly contradictory texts. A very famous, world-renowned Jewish, not Christian, but Jewish archaeologist, Nelson Gluck, said, no archaeological discovery has ever controverted a biblical reference. You can't say that about the religious writings of other religions. Judaism, of course, is in, Judaism and Christianity are both covered in the, in the Bible. Then the, the next thing, the last thing I'll say on this podcast, but not the last thing that can be said about this subject, is the Bible claims to be inspired and inerrant, and it seems to be, and it proves to be. It seems to be divinely dis inspired, as again and again its precepts are found to be true by those who follow them, and its words seem inspired by those who, whose hearts are stirred by them. But the Bible actually proves to be God's word by the test of predictive prophecy, which itself, the Bible itself, prescribes for its proof. In Deuteronomy 18, the Lord said to Moses, and Moses wrote, that how, we, how will we know if a prophet, which is the writers of the scripture of prophets, whether it's a true prophet or a false prophet? And the Lord said, if the things that he predicts come true, then you'll know that the Lord has spoken. But if they don't, it won't. And so within the, the books that are in the canon, uh, the prophets wrote of things that were predicted, but that were fulfilled within the lifetime of the prophet. And they also wrote of things that were predicted later, after they, they died. And so in their lifetime, the prophecies that were coming true convinced the eyewitnesses to those prophecies who knew that the prophet had set up before the thing came to pass, they, they then believed that these men were speaking the word of God. And then the other prophecies that had not come true yet are then believed to be true as well. A lot more that can be said about this. There's, there's whole textbooks written just on this one subject of the inspiration and authority of the Holy Scriptures. The last uh, one of these questions I want to discuss is the question of miracles. This was actually a question I had as a teenager. You know, how can we believe that Jonah was swallowed by a fish, that Mary conceived uh, Jesus without uh, having known any man, that um, Jesus walked on the water, that uh, Moses, uh, that the Red Sea, that God split the Red Sea, you know, all these fantastical things. And what, especially on a college campus, and I've been a college professor throughout my career, on a college campus, people say, well, you know, these miracles were record the records of ignorant people who didn't understand science, and that science uh, has, you know, now we are more sophisticated and we don't believe these fantastic fables these myths that are created uh, to, to persuade people, uh, to influence people. Well, so the first thing I'd say about this is even modern science can't explain the miracles in the Bible. It is very significant that this is true. If, if one was trying to do parlor tricks, one would be able to explain these things. For example, how the seas might divide at the command of a man with a raised stick or all firstborn children are dying who are not in houses with blood on doorposts, or people blind from birth receiving their sight from mud and water being pressed on their eyes, or the dead being raised after four days in the grave. These are not things 
that you'd say that this is something that, well, if we had scientists there today, they'd be able to figure this out. No scientist would be able to figure out those things. The real question is not how could these miracles occur. How they can occur is the God who created the universe certainly has the power to do anything he wants within that universe. But the real question is not how do they occur, how do they occur, God makes them occur. The real question is, do they occur? The real question is the historical question, did it happen, rather than how did it happen? And certainly science is never going to answer the, this question. Did the miracles in the Bible occur? The prophecies of the writers of Scripture were often confirmed this way. That is why their writings have been preserved, the miraculous nature of their predictions. You know, when the Red Sea divides or when uh, uh, Elijah raises the dead or whatever, these are impressive things that impress the people then. Now, but how can we go back and prove historically that these things occur? And it's very, it's made more difficult because the best historical record of these things is the Bible itself. And a critic will say, well, you're using circular reasoning, you're using the Bible to confirm itself. But there are many miracles in Scripture that are impossible or difficult to prove at this point in history. But there are many that can be. Many Old Testament prophecies remain unfulfilled and not contradicted. Some of these have come to pass miraculously even in our time. For example, the rebirth of the nation of Israel. By all accounts, this is a miraculous event. Not only was Israel reformed as a nation with the people in the diaspora, that is the Jews from all over the world, coming back to Israel, but they came back and resurrected the original Hebrew language. And if you go on the streets of Jerusalem today, you can hear the kind of Hebrew being spoken that was spoken of uh, by the prophets in the Old Testament long ago. The resurrection of Jesus is the greatest miracle probably uh, ever recorded, and there is historical evidence for it. And not only that, miracles occur today. There are miraculous answers to prayer that occur, even in my own body. I was going blind, and by a miracle, actually the doctors recorded the miracle of the sight that, that uh, was preserved in, in, my, in my head. And there are other examples of this of miraculous answers to prayer, not coincidences. Well, there's other questions that um, we can look at, and I think especially, it's in, I think it's in the teen years is when young people begin to be confronted by questions of, is this really true? I think it's probably in the early teen years it would be a good time for, these, for a discussion at least to begin. And as I've discussed this with my own children, one of the things I told them was, if they have any questions about our faith that they hear from friends or other places on the internet or wherever, that they would give me the opportunity to participate in the, in the conversation, uh, at least uh, be able to provide them with my own point of view. The first thing was that we're going to educate in um, doctrine. The second is to equip people, young people to be able to defend the faith, to have answers to the common criticisms. And then third and lastly is to explain the moral principles that are contained in God's Word. These moral choices reveal what we truly believe about God, about His Word, about His plan for His life. Uh, Titus wrote this, to the pure all things are pure, but to those who are defiled and unbelieving nothing is pure, but both their mind and their consciences are defiled. They profess to know God, but by their deeds they deny him, being detestable and disobedient and worthless for any good deed. What about these moral principles? 
Are these arbitrary things? Actually, no. They're answers to our greatest and deepest need. God loves us, and so his commandments, although we often don't see them this way, we may be tempted to break various ones of their commandments. Our young sons, for example, lust is a, always a big problem, but, the, but actually by obeying the commandments, we have the answer to our greatest and deepest needs. Let me give you a few examples. Emptiness. There are many young people in the coroner's office in which I work. It is so tragic the number of young suicides that we, that we deal with. Many young people attempt to fill their lives with material possessions, with relationships, with sex. Augustine uh, said of the Lord. He said, Thou hast made us for thyself, O God, and our hearts are restless till they find their rest in thee. And Jesus said, I came that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. Well, if you don't have life in Jesus, you're not going to have life abundantly. And if you don't have life abundantly, there is an emptiness problem that you're going to be dealing with. The second need or the second problem is purposelessness. Many today are living aimless lives. To this Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. John 8, verse 12. And so by walking with the Lord in the light, what the scripture says, we find purpose. Third problem, fear. Many young people live in fear that they're afraid because of the rising crime rate. They're afraid of the epidemic of virulent diseases, lethal diseases like HIV. They're in fear because of war. They're in fear of unfulfilled dreams. These fears and anxieties are very common. Jesus said, I'm the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. And there's other places that we could say, but when, when there is the fear of the Lord and the love of the Lord and others, we find that courage often results. We look at all the martyrs who astonished the people that were putting them to death with the peace that they had in their hearts as they faced uh, imminent death. Another problem that comes from moral failures is anxiousness. There is a phenomenal market for pop psychology and self-help books today. Why is this? It's because we have a lot of anxiousness and a lot of depression. And so people are, are looking around for uh, ways to solve this, uh, this problem. But Jesus said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, John 14, 27. And he also said, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. fact of the matter is the burden of life in this world is not easy and it's not light. By taking the yoke of Jesus, by trusting in him and walking with him, uh, having him in our, in our hearts, then we find this cure for an anxiousness. Another problem is loneliness. Social interactions have actually diminished in our culture, even though social media is, has greatly expanded, because these electronic friendings and texting and, and other methods are not satisfying uh, deeply to the soul. They are really superficial so social interactions. Extended families are rarely together in our culture as children have moved away from their ancestral communities. Divorce is an epidemic. Jesus said he would be with us always. He gives us love for and from other believers so that we are part of a family. The friendships that we can have in Christ with our Christian brothers and sisters can satisfy this deep inner longing to be understood and accepted. And the last problem, and there are many other problems, but the last problem I want to mention here is lack of self-control. Paul said to Timothy, 
God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of love, power, and self-control. But that's to those who know the Lord, who have been born again. This is one of the gifts, is, is this self-control. He also said, it was for freedom Christ has set you free. Keep standing firm then and don't submit again to a yoke of slavery. And he added this key thought, you were called to freedom, only don't turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Christians who are involved in others' lives find that they have more self-control as the Spirit fills them. Okay, so this is some of the solutions to the number of uh, young people who leave the faith if they have been discipled uh, in, uh, in these categories. But there's another problem, and that is young who may in fact be Christians, or maybe they're not, but they hold views that are not Christian views, and they don't even realize it. As a matter of fact, this is very widespread. Too often, a healthy Christian teenager is defined by those who believe in God as one who acts nicely and isn't pregnant on drugs or in jail. So, you know, well, you know, they're in church and they're not pregnant, they're not doing drugs, so this, this means that everything that they believe must be accurate. They, they've got the right ideas. Well, that's, that's, sadly, that's not true. Um, a healthy teenage Christian might better be defined as one with a passionate love for and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ that shows itself in an unquenchable love and concern for others. The question is, do we truly communicate this to our young people, or do we leave them with the impression that we're really happy because they're nice, they're not pregnant, they're not in, on drugs or in jail? And as a matter of fact, a number of people who are on drugs and in jail actually are, may be Christians. You know, so that's, uh, while this is not a good thing for the life of that individual or others, that's not an adequate criteria. What we spend our energy, time, and money on is our actual message. Are we concerned with scripture memorization as we are about academics? Are we as fired up about Christ as we are about a sports team? Do our children know that no accomplishment would be more meaningful to us than seeing them making an impact for God's kingdom? We must communicate that sports, the arts, academics are all avenues that are legitimate and they're good for ministry, but that's not necessarily the most important thing. If we grow wise by walking with the wise— do our churches provide opportunities for, the old, for those who are older and wiser in the faith to pass a spiritual legacy on to the next generation? Are we intentionally surrounding teens with Bible-saturated older saints? Or rather, are we looking for young hep people to have a good time with our youth and not necessarily share wisdom with them? Uh, here's an interesting proverb, Proverbs chapter 13, verse 20. He who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. The method of splitting up by age was an application of evolutionary principles. Did you know that? The whole idea of aged classes, it comes out of the evolutionists. It's not the biblical pattern where in, in the Bible, younger generations glean wisdom from older individuals. Youth groups sometimes even detract from maturity because the emphasis is mostly on fun, reinforcing the mindset that they are still children and feeding an attitude of self-indulgence during these supposed limbo years. We must therefore diligently build into our young people the understanding that they are called to make an impact now. You know, before this evolutionary approach to splitting people up by ages happened in the United States in the public school movement, was then adopted in Sunday school, um, before that, it was not uncommon for people who were 10 or 12 to actually have jobs. 
They were often working with their fathers, working on a farm in the field. You know, even David, what you know, was a shepherd engaged in work that produced a profit. You know, the lambs uh, were multiplying, and this was creating more uh, income. Paul says in Ephesians, Therefore be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Well, obviously we can't understand what the will of the Lord is until, until and unless we can see what the will of the Lord is. And this is where older people, uh, you know, and Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to obey all that I command you. You know, and uh, this, this is discipleship, and this is what our youth need. In a survey of theological beliefs, researchers asked self-professing Christians to respond to a series of 34 statements related to classic historic Christian biblical doctrine. In every answer offered related to these theological beliefs, young people between the ages of 18 and 34 consistently held heretical views at a higher percentage than older respondents. Young people who identified themselves as Christians are far more likely to hold views that aren't even Christians. Let me give you some examples. More than two-thirds of Americans disagree that the smallest sin deserves eternal damnation, and 58% strongly disagree. This was, this is alarming. A majority of adults in the United States, 58%, say that worshiping alone or with one's family is a valid replacement for regularly attending church. Only 30% disagree. A majority of U.S. adults, 59%, say that the Holy Spirit is a force, not a personal being. This relativism that is so common creates this casual outlook. Six in ten Americans agree that religious belief is a matter of personal opinion and not about objective truth. And, and this is what's really shocking. One in three evangelicals, 32% of evangelicals, agree. The de facto dominant religion among contemporary U.S. teenagers, including evangelicals, is what is called moralistic therapeutic deism. Moralistic therapeutic deism. A God exists who created and orders the world and watches over human life on earth. God wants people to be good, nice, and fair to each other, as taught in the Bible and by most other world religions. The central goal of life is to be happy and to feel good about oneself. God does not need to be particularly involved in one's life except when God is needed to resolve a problem. And good people, as defined by this moralistic therapeutic deism, go to heaven when they die. You know, and what's the definition of good people? This is this is what the epide- this is what I found. I was interviewing a young lady for membership in the church and it was not clear she was speaking in moralistic terms about being a good person is what makes a, a Christian. There's a study called the National Study of Youth and Religion, the most extensive research on religious lives of the U.S. teenagers to date, found that teens are functional deists. They believe God exists, created the world, set life in motion, but he only becomes involved with them personally to make their lives happier or to solve problems. Many conservative Protestant teens reject the essential doctrine of salvation by grace. Three out of five believe you can earn a place in heaven if you are generally good or do enough good things for others. When deciding right from wrong in difficult situations, only 31% of Southern Baptist teens said they turned to God or the scriptures. Almost an identical percent said they decided based on whether it made them feel happy or helped them get ahead. Well, (laughs) this is just devastating. And I think uh, this is because we have a job to do here as fathers and as people in the church to take responsibility for this. 
uh, you know, in, in Judges, a, a generation arrived that didn't know the Lord. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And that's the kind, uh, that's the, the situation that we've created in this, in this country. I'm going to wrap this up in just a little bit, but I, I want to do two things. One, I want to quickly, briefly explain the gospel. How does one become a, a Christian? I'm going to use two different verses. We'll discuss them very briefly. Are young people able to know the address of these verses? Do they know these verses? Have they memorized these verses? Can they explain to someone else, this is how you become a believer? Okay, the first verse is, they're both in the book of Romans. The first is in Romans 6, and I'm going to read 22 and 23. It's actually 23 is the key verse, but 22 gives the context. And this is what it says. This is the gospel. But now, having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derive your benefit resulting in sanctification and the outcome eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Okay, so wages are something that is earned. So the wages of sin is what we've earned from how we live our lives. Sin is either actively fighting God or simply excluding him from our lives. When we do this, of course, it makes God seem far away. Death. Death is separation from life. Because God is the author of life, a spiritual death simply means separation from him. So the wages of sin is death, both in this life and in the life to come. But, but means we now have a contrast, the free gift. A gift is not like wages. Wages are something that is earned. A gift is not earned. The person receiving it, uh, someone else has to purchase a gift. Uh, the gift comes from someone else, of God. So God is the one who makes the gift. It's God himself, and it's so special that no one else can give it. And what is it? Eternal life. Eternal life is the opposite of separation from God and death. In Christ Jesus our Lord, every gift has a unique giver. Only Jesus Christ can give the gift of eternal life. Okay, so how do we receive this? This is in Romans 9, verse 9. If you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So there are two parts. Confessing with your mouth results in salvation. Believing in your heart, not just believing anything, believing this one thing, that God raised him from the dead. With the heart, a person believes, resulting in righteousness. So this is the gospel. It's a free gift from God, and the, the gift includes eternal life, and we receive it by confessing with our mouth. Our mouth says, Jesus is Lord, and believe in our heart that in the resurrection that God raised him from the dead, then we're, we are a believer. We, and when we do this, that's not a matter of how we feel. It's a matter of what we are. You know, when, when uh, Debbie and I got married, I didn't feel married. It was a, I felt that I'd been through a ceremony, but what does it feel like to be married? Well, it doesn't matter. I was married. You know, I get a driver's license. I've got a license to drive. I may not feel like I'm a driver, but now I, I have this piece of paper. I have this contract. And that's what, that's what Christianity is. It's not a feeling. It's not when I feel good or I feel bad. It's... It's a contract, it's a promise from God that if we confess and believe, then, uh, then, we are, then the Holy Spirit comes in and regenerates it. We get, we get love, we get self-control, and all these other things. So then the, the last thing, and i close with this, is, but we question, am I really a Christian? How can I know whether I'm really a Christian? And the Bible answers this. It's actually the subject of an entire book of the Bible is to give uh, born-again believers confidence that they have eternal life. And the book is 1 John. John tells us in his epistle, 1 John, at the, at the end, chapter 5, verse 13, he says, These things I have written to you who believe in the name 
of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is the confidence which we have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know we have the requests that we have asked from him. And so John wrote the epistle to give confidence to believers that they have eternal life. Why did he do this? Because he knows that we have doubts. We have doubts because of troubles that we have in this life. We have doubts because of feelings. We have doubts because of guilt and sin. But the question is not, it doesn't say, so if you confess that Jesus is the Son of God and live a perfect life, you will have eternal life. It doesn't say that. It's a free gift. It's not a wage, and it's not how we feel. Okay, so what are the tests? Well, there's three tests. Now, these tests are not tests that we pass. Rather, they're measures. I've, my career's been in medicine, so let's say that the test I'm going to do is a blood pressure. Well, you don't, it's not a pass or fail. You know, you measure the blood pressure. Another test might be a thermometer. You know, and you put a thermometer in a person's mouth and you say, well, it's, you know, they've got a fever or they've got a normal body temperature. So each one of these tests are, are measures of the work of the Holy Spirit. And it's not, it is not that these things have to be in perfection and complete, but to the extent that we get a reading of a body temperature, a blood pressure, a heart rate, something like that, to that extent, we have confidence. So here's the three. The first is called the moral test. And this one is a big hang-up. I've experienced a lot of people end up feeling guilty when they read this test because they don't understand what I just said, that it's not a pass-fail. First John starts us by saying, if we say we have no sin, we're a liar and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So in chapter 2, this is what First John says. He says, by this we know that we have come to know him. In other words, this is how we can have confidence that we're a real believer, if we keep his commandments. The one who says, I've come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But he who ever keeps his word, in him the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. Okay, so you see the problem. Uh, well, if we keep his commandments, well, of course, we don't. You know, and he says, well, if he does not keep his commandments, he's a liar. Well, the tense of that verb means that if we, if we chronically, if we are cl chronically violating his commandments, then we're not. This is the experience. It, was my, it, it has been my experience, and it's the experience of most people that I have spoken to about this subject. When we become a believer... There are some sins that just vanish. There are things that are just, they're gone. We, all things are made new and we have a new perspective and we just no longer struggle with that. We can almost often see when a young person comes to Christ, you can almost see it in their face. There, there's something different. There's a love for, for uh, other people that wasn't there and whatever. But at the same time, there are other sins that we call besetting sins that don't just vanish, that we struggle with. We, we gain victory over these as we submit to the Lord and, and follow him. But it's this progress in, in being sanctified as we grow in our obedience that we also gain this confidence that we are truly born again. Okay, the second test is called the social test. So the first test is the moral test. The second is the social, and it's love. John explains it this way in the, in the verses right after the moral test. He says, Beloved, beloved, I'm not writing a new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you've had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard. On the other hand, I am writing a new commandment to you, which is true in him and in you because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. The, and here it is, verse 9. 
The one who says he is in the light and yet hates his brother is in darkness until now. The one who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But the one who hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Okay, so love. Love for especially brothers. That means other believers. In chapter 4, he repeats this. He says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. By this the love of God was manifested in us, that God sent his only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Okay, so this command to love is the second test. And often I think it's the easiest for others to notice. I've found there are young people that are worried about whether they're really believers. And they may be worried for different reasons. Um, maybe they are having trouble conforming to what they see in a youth group. And they think the youth group is the test, whether they fit in or not, rather than... See, all of these are work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is doing this. So when we're born again, the, the Spirit comes into our lives, makes us new, and begins producing this fruit, first of obedience and second of love. And it's not that obedience is more important than love. These are three different things. Okay, and then the third and final is the doctrinal test. So we have the moral test, the social test, and the doctrinal test. We have obedience, love, and truth truth. In John chapter 2, following on from the love test, children, it is the last hour, just as you heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have appeared. From this we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not really of us, for if they had been of us, they would have remained with us, but they went out so that it would be shown that they are not of us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you all know. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it. See, there's the test, the truth. Because no lie is of the truth. Whoever is a liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ, this is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father. Here it is. The one who confesses the Son has the Father also. As for you, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, will also abide in the Son and the Father. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they're from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. You see that from the one who confesses that Jesus is the Son of God and believes in his heart that God raised him from the dead, he has eternal life. Because you can only confess that if you have the Holy Spirit in you. One without the Holy Spirit doesn't believe that in his heart, doesn't know that, and it's not that truth. And it's just it's really just that simple. You can say, well, that can be faked. Well, yeah, people can say that they believe that when they don't really, I suppose, false confessors. There can be false assurance if you're using standards other than what Scripture has given us. But these are the three, that we, that we know the truth and we encourage each other. You know, when you say, well, I thought this person was a Christian. Well, very often that's because that person's irritated me, it's failed me, I think he's a hypocrite, and there's a lot of us who are hypocrites. You know, but that's not the test. He's really a brother and we're to love him if he knows, if he believes in his heart and confesses with his mouth that Jesus is Lord, if he loves other believers, maybe not all of them, but there's love for within the body. I know a number of people that I've had the privilege of sharing the gospel with and who've expressed faith, who thought that, that Christians were, were weird and some kind of mentally ill people. And then they become Christians and all of a sudden 
their hearts are just knit. They, they enjoy being around other Christians. Maybe not all, but, but as this grows. Okay. So I hope you take this podcast seriously. I hope you think about these things and you share them with young people. Let's not take for granted that if we think we know something, that that means that our young people know it as well. Even if we've said it to them before, they may not recall it. We may not have had their full attention when we've had conversations. I want to I want to enclose, uh, conclude with this exhortation, and this or- exhortation is one that Paul gave to his his young son in the Lord Timothy just before he was martyred. This is like the the last words of Paul. It comes in the first chapter of Second Timothy. The whole epistle of Second Timothy is really this last will and testament of Paul to Timothy and of older men like me to all younger men in the faith. He said, I thank God whom I serve with a clear conscience the way my forefathers did as I constantly remember you in my prayers night and day, longing to see you even as I recall your tears so that I may be filled with joy. So he starts out giving Timothy an example. Men, we need to be an example to younger men. And in this example, Paul is thankful to God for the younger man, Timothy, for the young men in our lives. And he says, whom I serve with a clear conscience the way my forefathers did. He's talking about these generations. I have tried to tell my son stories about their grandfather and their great-grandfathers so that they can see this passing from generation to generation. And then Paul goes on and says, I'm mindful of the sincere faith within you, which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am sure that is in you as well. So see, Paul talked about his forefathers, and now he's talking about Timothy's forebears. In this case, Timothy, it was his mother and grandmother, not fathers and grandfathers, but that the faith it didn't start with Timothy, didn't start with Paul. It hasn't started with me, and it doesn't start with our young people. Rather, they have this generational heritage. And this is the exhortation. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. So the first thing is don't be ashamed. We need to call our young people to not be ashamed of Jesus, but to join with us in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. What does that suffering mean? It means being willing to accept the taunts, to accept the low grades in class, to accept the, the rejection uh, of um, of our peers, for and we do this for the sake of the gospel. Why? Because the power of God has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to His purpose and grace, which was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. In other words, it's been a gift that we've received. And Paul says in verse twelve, "For this reason I suffer all these things, but I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I'm convinced." that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until this day. And here's the final exhortation. Remember this. Retain the standard of sound words which you have heard from me in the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us the treasure which has been entrusted to you. And so, like a baton, in a relay race, the gospel, the Bible, the truth has been passed down to us from our forefathers in the faith, from those who believed before us and, and uh, transmitted that faith to us. And we are to give it to our young sons and daughters. And we, as we give it to them, we say, retain the standard of sound words which you've heard and faith and love and guard with the Holy Spirit this treasure. During the Dark Ages, Bibles were burned. 
and the writings of the church fathers were destroyed throughout Europe and in much of the world. But in the British Isles, in, in Ireland and Scotland, there were libraries, and those libraries kept the books. And it said, were it not for the work of those saints and the Holy Spirit guarding these truths, much of those ancient libraries would be lost. Now, of course, it was God who was guarding it. But our sons are like those libraries. As darkness goes over our land, if our sons can't articulate the faith, if they are not walking in the Spirit, being led by His Spirit, if we are not discipling them, if we're not teaching them explicitly this, this is our greatest calling as fathers, that we do this. And I became burdened with this, and in this podcast I wanted to share this my heart with you. I hope you're encouraged and challenged by this. I look forward to being with you in the next podcast where we will begin talking about the glorious command we have. I mean, it's amazing. You know, God says, love your wives. <laughs> oh, you know, when I was single, I look forward to the day when I would have a, life to, a wife to love, and then he says, love your wife and I say okay I think I will and it's a wonderful thing I, I can't wait to share uh, the glory of a husband's love for his wife and we'll begin doing that in the next podcast please pray with me father thank you for the Holy Spirit thank you for the new life that we can have in Christ thank you for the faith that comes from your Holy Spirit Lord I pray that you would equip all of our sons and their sons and our daughters and their daughters with your Holy Spirit, that you would give them the gift of eternal life, that they would be courageous to join in suffering for the gospel, that they would guard it with the Holy Spirit, the truth of your word, which is so precious and is a treasure that you have given to us. We ask this not just for ourselves, but we ask this that Jesus will be glorified in coming generations. We pray in his name, amen. Thank you for listening to the Basic Training Podcast, taught by Dr. Robert Forney. This podcast is available on Spotify and the Google and Apple Podcast apps, also on the Basic Training YouTube channel. If you want to contact us with any comments or questions, please email basictrainingpodcast at gmail.com. Thank you for listening, and God bless.